OK, so just before we start coding, uh, some more remarks. So in this topic three, which is uh, most easily uh, accessed here, on just on the main side, uh, topic three, classification, decision trees, k nearest neighbors. Uh, just a couple of more uh, uh, details. Yep. So how decision trees work with uh, numeric features. So it's going to be a really three minutes overview just for you to dive into the topic uh, if you are interested. OK, so for such a feature like age, a numeric one, and a target variable like loan default, whether client is good or bad, uh, we need to somehow check uh, all thresholds, right? So comparing age to all these uh, values, to 17 years, 25, 33. So actually, there are some nice heuristics how you, you can uh, make it more efficient. So you actually don't need to check all of them, and you don't need to, to calculate information gain for every split. There's really some uh, nice heuristics how you can recalculate your information gain out of already calculated ones. OK, so this is about numeric features. Uh, and you'll, you'll get some trees like that. Uh, <coughs> then also some more discussions about uh, decision trees hyperparameters. Some more words about decision tree as in a regression problem. So we'll be, be predicting uh, a numeric target variable. Uh, so it's actually a topic of uh, assignment, just to go much deeper into this uh, regression problem with the decision trees. Uh, I would only say that the procedure is just the same. Again, a recursion uh, algorithm which, uh, wi with a, a simple routine. But here, a routine will be optimizing a, a bit different criterion. Uh, in this case, in a regression problem, it will be just a variance of your values in leaves. And only a small comment on, uh, on them, because it's really interesting uh, that de decision trees can generalize to regression problem as well. So we'll have a, a data set with a target variable like uh, age, just a numeric feature, 17, 18, 92, uh, 32. And we'll have some features. So we'll have all the X metrics here, our training set. And we'll try to split with some, with some uh, value. We'll pick a feature, let's say, FJ, uh, feature number J. We'll compare it to some threshold. OK, and uh, either this condition takes place or not. So yes or no. But in this case, our target, target feature is uh, uh, numeric. And we'll have some two groups. And an ideal variant will be to, to split uh, into, let's say, if we predict age, an, an ideal variant will be to split into young and old. So let's say we'd like some values, some close values like, like 17, 18, 22, 14 here, and maybe some values like uh, 32, 90, 92, 80 here. And we can measure it actually with uh, variance around the mean. So actually, for prediction, this tree will return. So when we will have a test object and uh, we, it will get to this leaf, we'll just predict uh, nothing better than just a mean value. So we'll calculate mean here. Let's say it's uh, 20 years. So it's uh, mean value of your target in this left group. And uh, by the same token here, uh, the mean value, maybe it's uh, 45. And again, it's a mean value in your right. Uh, leaf. Okay, and actually you can measure the goodness of, of this split uh, with variance around the mean. So we can calculate variance of your observations of your target values uh, in the left group and in the right one. And so you'll, you'll have something like, like that. Uh, so variance around, uh, around the mean. No, it's actually uh, almost the same as uh, statistical definition of uh, variance. Uh, just here it means that uh, these are target variables in your leaves. Okay, and so actually your task in the third assignment is, is to delve much deeper into it, uh, to understand it, to build simple decision trees for regression, just one-dimensional trees, and actually to get understanding of that. On, contrary, on the contrary, in, uh, in a demo task, it's uh, actually the previous assignment, it's now, now it's public, even with a solution, uh, there's a much deeper dive into classification. So the idea behind uh, all, of, all of this criterion, entropy, and one more information gain, which I leave you to, to study, it's also very simple. OK, the task was just to get intuition just on your fingers with toy examples. Uh, so it was about classification. So I definitely encourage you to go through it. Uh, so it's 
published already with a solution. And uh, in, in a new one, you'll be dealing with regression. Mm. One second. <coughs> okay. So, and then. And an example of a decision tree prediction with a regression is going to be something like that. If we've got some uh, underlying function li like that, depicted with just a blue line, we've got some samples uh, and artificial examples, so an example with uh, values around this target function. Okay, and a decision tree is going to also build some ladder, some uh, piecewise constant function. So, and the deeper is the tree, the, the closer we get to this uh, actually target function. Okay, I'm skipping KNN, but uh, encourage you to read it. And uh, we've got two optional assignments this week. Uh, one is going to be really challenging. So, if you if you like algorithms, you can build your decision tree algorithm from scratch, even with some heuristics uh, for efficiency. And uh, for KNN, I would recommend uh, the first part of uh, CS. 3 to 1. It's a course actually on neural nets, but some first parts are just about classic algorithm, uh, machine learning algorithms, not neural nets. And the first assignment, uh, first part is just about KNN. So a KNN is really very, very simple algorithm. But you'll see here, you, uh, they will ask you to implement it uh, in a very efficient way, in a vectorized form. Uh, let me just find it. Um, syllabus. So if you want some more challenge, go for assignment one. Okay, so again, there are some Jupyter notebooks here. It's about image classification. So we'll extract very, very simple from images. And uh, we, we all, we'll also have an example of that. Uh, so the first part uh, will be writing an efficient vectorized implementation of KNN algorithm. Uh, it's not as uh, challenging as building a decision tree from scratch, but still uh, thinking of a vectorized form, you know, not doing, uh, not actually executing an algorithm with quadratic complexity, but uh, uh, applying some ready NumPy functions for that. It's uh, just another way of thinking of building efficient algorithm. Okay, so if you are really fond of algorithms and data structures and how it actually all works under the hood, uh, I encourage you to, to do optional assignments. Okay, you can always find them here on the main site in, on an assignment step. So here's a link to an <coughs> optional assignment about implementing a decision tree. Okay, so before actually starting coding, uh, let's discuss uh, one more important thing. So again, just in, in a couple of words, uh, but, it's, but it's important. Uh, actually, pros and cons of decision trees. Okay, some text here, just uh, don't mind. Uh, you can uh, read it uh, in the lecture material. I will name the, the most important ones. So a decision tree is really very quick to, to build. So uh, you see it's a binary tree. It's some, it shall be some sort of a logarithmic function. Uh, you can also uh, delve much deeper into computational complexity of building a decision tree when you, you've got uh, L instances with D features and so on. But still, in practice, it's very, very quick to build. Uh, that's a, definitely a plus, uh, <coughs> an advantage. It's very well interpreted. Uh, okay, this statement can be, cr uh, can be criticized when you've got thousands of features and lots of splits and the decision tree is very, very deep. It's not very simple to, to visualize. But at least you can build uh, the top of the tree and see what uh, general rules it, it actually produces. Okay, so it's, maybe it's the most uh, interpretable uh, algorithm. Uh, then it can handle numeric and categorical features. Uh, so in, in practice, it's very good for your for tasks when you've got features of different types. Uh, so if you don't deal with uh, images, sound, and large collection of texts, it's uh, it's a very nice uh, algo. Well, the main disadvantage is that on its own, a decision tree doesn't work very well in terms of uh, actually the quality of classification measured in, in terms of accuracy or some other metrics. Uh, so these hyperparameters uh, shall be tuned. Uh, well, it's a, also a general statement. Mo most of algorithms need some parameters to be tuned. 
Only that some uh, algorithms work out of the box. Uh, some don't work very good out of the box very well. Uh, okay, so decision tree needs these hyper param parameters to be tuned. Uh, actually, when your data set is not too big, it's not a problem. Decision tree is so fast to actually to be built so that th you can actually check lots of variants to check lots of uh, combinations of maximal depth, uh, mean sample sleeve, and, and so on. Well, the problem of building th uh, the least uh, possible decision tree that would work perfect for uh, this problem, it's known uh, a hard problem computational. It's actually an NP-complete problem. OK, so in uh, simple words, it means it, it's hard. So actually, this information gain and uh, gene impurity and variance cr criteria, these are just heuristics. So actually, I haven't seen really very deep foundations for them, just heuristics. Uh, heuristics are some rules that happen to work in practice, you know? Uh, so I haven't seen really some connections with the generalization ability. So if you optimize exactly this entropy, you are going to build a model that will work on an infinite set from the same distribution. Okay, I ha haven't seen statements like that, and I searched hard. <laughs> so my PhD was some somewhat connected with it. Uh, well, so one of the serious disadvantages is that uh, a decision tree cannot extrapolate. So it can only build a nice uh, function uh, in a part of the space where you, you've got training data. So just a simple picture to I illustrate this. If, we've got, if we solve a binary classification problem, uh, separating pluses from minuses, let's say. Ah, one moment. OK, so if we've got a typical binary classification problem, uh, pluses and minuses, as usual, uh, a decision tree is going to, to build a nice, uh, maybe a nice uh, decision boundary only in this region where you've got your data distribution. So how it works here or here or, he or here, you'll see it will be really very bad. So if you don't have samples in these parts of your feature space, then a decision tree is not going to work uh, really well here. Because you see, it will build something like uh, a decision uh, boundary like, like this, or maybe this. OK, so to perfectly classify here, it will build a decision, decision boundary like that. And here, it can only extrapolate like with a constant. Uh, OK, so it has no data here to choose right splits. So it's, it's only going to. Uh, to continue with these splits that it has. That means that uh, it's uh, good at interpolating in a data region that you, you have uh, actually ob observations. It's not going to extrapolate to unseen regions of your feature space. In some applications, this might be a problem. Not always. So forest and uh, random forest and uh, Gradient boosting are used here and there and everywhere. Uh, they're based on decision trees. Why do they actually work? Because uh, this is not a desired case uh, for your actual problem. So typically, you, you've got some data set. Uh, and uh, by design, your machine learning algorithms are not going to really generalize to unseen data. So the, all these question marks, you see, we don't have data here. So actually, it's not going to work. Uh, the reason. This actually works nice well because with large data set, we have lots of examples. So our feature space where we've got actually instances is uh, enlarged. So it's much larger. So if we have instances, uh, our uh, instances from training set in all regions, OK, so then we can interpolate in these regions as well. OK, I would say it's not often the case that we need to make a prediction for some uh, values, let's say, for of age that we don't have data for. Of course, it's not going to work. So deci decision tree can't work for this uh, problem by design. But still, it's not a huge problem in, in real life. You see, if we've got a training set with people from 30 to 50, we understand that we can't generalize to youngsters or old people. Uh, so decision tree can't do it. But we, still, we are not interested in this task, uh, typically. We don't have data for, the, for that. We are not going to, to have a good model if we don't have data. Captain, obvious. 
Okay. Uh, actually, these are uh, typical disadvantages. And uh, one more important part is I won't call it a disadvantage. It's uh, some, uh, I would say, peculiarity that it, it doesn't work nice with the large dimensions. So this idea of checking all splits and choosing the best information gain, it doesn't work when you've got uh, hundred thousands or millions of features. And in some tasks, we, we typically have even millions of features. We'll cover this with linear models. So I would say a rule of, a rule of thumb, if you've got more than uh, 10,000 features, uh, just switch to linear models. Depends on your application, maybe neural nets, uh, but as a simple model, just, just a linear model. So with lots and lots of features, the idea of actually finding a good split and actually finding uh, a split based on information gain. So all these steps uh, just don't work really nice with uh, very large f f uh, dimensions. Okay, now let's start uh, implementing it from scratch. So not a decision tree, but uh, calling it from sklearn. Okay, so just a simple template in order not to repeat all these steps with preprocessing, we switched back to our telecom churn dataset. So for now, I, I'm importing only pandas and visualization tools. Uh, okay, we've seen it uh, a couple of times. <coughs> Here we'd like to predict this churn variable. So now it's we definitely see a binary classification problem. We've got some features, uh, some uh, 19 features, and uh, the 20th is going to be predicted. Just as a bit of preprocessing, uh, I map yes no values into zeros and ones. Uh, I uh, change the type of a churn variable to be actually zeros and ones. Uh, and here, state is a categorical variable. So, uh, just out of the box, it's not handled with a learning algorithm, at least in sklearn. I would say here with uh, R packages, it's much better than can work with uh, string valued variables. Uh, for now, we'll just drop it. So here, the pop method actually returns this state variable and uh, removes it from the data frame. Uh, for now, let's just save states. Maybe we'll uh, find a usage for them. Uh, but uh, before that, we'll just use only numeric features. OK, so all of these th features are now numeric. Uh, and we are going to predict churn. So here, I split the data frame uh, into matrix x with our features and a, a target variable. Okay, and I see it's not ideal in translation. Uh, okay, now, okay, I'll remember to stick to the top part of the notebook. Okay, just a slight preprocessing, and we uh, <coughs> we have uh, matrix X with our features. Let's check sh its shape, X shape and Y shape. So, eighteen features to use to predict uh, the other one, x and y. So these are typical designations for the training set. OK, so we are going to build an algorithm. So we'll split our data. For now, just in, in two parts. So we'll make a holdout data set. And we'll, uh, so typically, it's 70 to 30 uh, split. And we'll do it with uh, sklearn train test split. So from sklearn. Model selection, so it deals with model selection actually. Uh, we import train test split. Shift tab and inline documentation. Okay, not very helpful. Shift tab again. Uh, okay, and you can read about it. So it, it actually takes your, your data. So we'll pass X and Y here. And we'll pass here a test size. So uh, actually, it's, it's what I call here holdout data. Test size uh, e equals to 0, 03. That will mean that we leave 30% uh, of our data just to check our model in the end. Well, this is a, a randomized procedure. So for reproducibility, you will specify a random state. Uh, it can be any number. I will pick my favorite, uh, let's say 17. Uh, that means that, uh, so no sense at all in the absolute value of this number, like with entropy. Yep, no meaning in absolute value. But if you execute this cell twice with the same random state, uh, then the results will be the same. Um, 
so actually it's a seed for your pseudo random numbers generator. Uh, okay, what is returned here is uh, two parts. We'll call the, these x train and x uh, valid uh, for validation in the in the end. Uh, yeah, you see some confusion with terms here, either a test set or a validation. Uh, let's stick to holdout uh, that I used. So we'll have x train this 70% of our data and holdout 30%, and the same for targets, y train and y holdout. And sorry, ran, random state. Okay, now X train is going to contain 2,333 samples, and for holdout, there will be exactly 1,000. Actually, okay, just a coincidence. We had 3333 instances, one third of them is going to be exactly 1,000. Okay, so a scheme that I, I typically use is just to have a holdout set to check the model in the end. So what I typically do is I do this split so this is the original training set, X and Y. I do this first split into 70% and 30%. And uh, I do then cross-validation here, only with 70% of uh, data. <coughs> so here's, here goes cross-validation. With cross-validation, we just assess our accuracy uh, in the best way. We do hyperparameter tuning here with cross-validation. Uh, but it's but still with cross validation, if you try too many variants, you can overfit even to this part, even to this seventy percent, even if you use cross validation. So it's a really subtle concept. How can you overfit if you do cross validation? But the idea is that when checking too many variants, you'll pick some variant, some hyperparameter setting that will just by coincidence work really nice for this seventy percent of data. That's why we leave uh, we hold out a part of our data set to check only once when we have done with uh, hyperparameter tuning, feature selection, and everything that deals with cross-validation. So eventually, with cross-validation, we built a nice model on this 70% of our data, this, what we called X-train, and of course targets, Y-train. Okay, we've built it with 70% of data, and then we assess it only once in the end with the holdout set. And this will give us some intuition how it's going to work uh, on some data X test. Again, it's not perfect. So you see, again, this uh, a single split. So if this uh, assessment differs a bit with your cross validation, it's no good. So then you'll you'll need to somehow uh, actually select which to which metric to actually believe on which to rely, whether a cross validation or hold out. Uh, but, but typically, you check just both, uh, cross-validation accuracy and then holdout accuracy. And again, with large data sets, uh, you, your holdout assessment of uh, the quality of your model is going to be much more reliable. OK, so we'll use uh, this X-train, Y-train for cross-validation, and uh, then the, the last part with, uh, for holdout. So an ideal situation will be just to, cho uh, to check uh, accuracy on held out set only once. Uh, there's no strict rules for that. You can still uh, check it a couple of times, a couple, but it's not a good idea actually to check your model 100 times on your held out set because you, this will influence your decisions and you'll overfit with your held out set. So the idea is just to check it once, maybe twice, maybe th at most three times. Okay, for now I'm just going to build a decision tree and check how it works with held out set. And we'll see that with tuning it a bit, it's going to work uh, much better. Okay, so from sklearn, so now actually decision trees, from sklearn tree, I import a decision tree classifier. And you see there are a decision tree classifier and a regressor. So for now, we use a classifier. Okay, and we'll initialize our tree just with all arguments uh, by default, uh, let's take a look at these arguments. I will only fix random state again for reproducibility. Random state, let, let it be 17. What arguments are there? Actually, lots of them. Criterion, it's what we discussed. Uh, so actually, Gini is almost the same as entropy, 
only that it's calculated a bit faster without any logarithms. When you calculate many times logarithms, it can be an issue. It's much better to, to check something even simpler. OK, so lots of arguments, actually. But uh, the main ones are here. Here's max depth. By default, it's not restricted. None means the tree will grow until the end. This is uh, this hyperparameter of min samples leaf. OK, lots of lots others, others and um, Actually, these are the most important ones that will tune uh, via cross-validation. And now we just do fit and predict. So we fit our model with X train and Y train. That's what they call a fit predict part. So when you, you've done with uh, gathering data and understanding your problem, actually in a real world project, maybe machine learning will take not so much time, maybe 10% of your project time. Uh, okay, in jargon, it's called just fit predict. Many Keglers just think that it's all about all of machine learning is only about this fit predict thing. Of course, it's not. Of course, it's much more with uh, understanding your data, your problem, gathering data. Okay, but this simple machine learning part is about fitting your model and uh, predicting and checking your accuracy. Um, okay, so I initialize a tree and I fit it. Okay, so by default it. It prints itself. Uh, so actually, for now, we've just trained a model. Uh, we'll now visualize it. But first, let's just, just check uh, accuracy on holdout data. So what we do here, we'll calculate uh, accuracy. It's a very simple thing to do. So just a percentage of correct answers. But still, in SQLearn metrics, we'll have a special function for that, accuracy score. And we'll make a prediction. Let's uh, underline that it's a prediction for our holdout set. We'll take our model and uh, call predict function and pass here x holdout. Of course, I'm not passing here y holdout. So we holdout is a analog of our test set. We don't know answers for our test set. We use only our features to make a prediction. And now we've got a prediction. So it's going to be a vector of the same length of a 1,000. And we've got our correct answers for this holdout set. It's a vector of the same shape. Now we just compare these two with accuracy. Y holdout, uh, pred holdout. And you see, it's, so the task might be, you might think it's a sim uh, simple task, because 92% accuracy. It's not always the case. So what's, what's the most reasonable baseline? So is it good or bad? We, we, we've just had our first assessment of model accuracy, 92%. Is it actually good? The first reasonable baseline is just <coughs> just to check uh, the stupidest, the most stupid uh, ever baseline is just the proportion of your uh, bad, uh, good clients in your data set. So let's take a look at uh, y variable. Uh, let's, uh, let's do value counts. OK, it's NumPy array. Uh, <coughs> NumPy bin count does the same as value counts. OK, so y vector is uh, a vector of zeros and ones. Ah, OK, we still have series. Sorry. Sorry. OK, so just value counts. And we see its distribution. We can normalize it and see that uh, a reasonable baseline th in these tasks is going to be 85.5. So if we just predict that our customer is going to be good, uh, it's, it's going to be 85.5 accuracy around the same. Well, uh, typical tradition just to mention, uh, to designate class 1 as something useful. Uh, so we are actually interested in finding bad clients, uh, clients who are going to churn. We'll designate it with 1. So yeah, it doesn't correlate with uh, 1 being good or 0 being bad. OK, so 1 is just something we are uh, interested to predict. OK. so. 92% is is sort of better than uh, this reasonable baseline. Uh, at least it's uh, with eyeballing we see that <laughs> 92 is better than 85.5. So can we do better with hyperparameter tuning? So I'm not going to visualize this tree right now because it's of really high depth. It's it's built uh, till each leaf is uh, pure with only good or bad clients. 
Uh, let's just tune our tree and then we'll visualize the, the tuned one. Okay, this idea of cross validation uh, is implemented. The idea actually of uh, uh, searching nice parameters is implemented with model selection, uh, grid search CV. So CV is cross validation. Grid search is uh, searching your hyperparameters in some uh, grid. What's, th what's the grid actually? So the grid is going to be something like uh, that. We'll have some values of one hyperparameter, let's say max depth. And we'll have maybe some another hyperparameter. Maybe we would like to tune at the same time mean samples leaf, just to find the perfect combination, mean samples leaf. So different values of these discrete variables are going to form a two-dimensional grid. So actually, the procedure that we are going to do now is very computationally exhaustive. So we are going uh, to, to do cross-validation for each combination of max depth and mean sample sleeve. But so actually very stupidly. So just check all of these combinations and do cross-validation. And that's what is done in grid search CV. OK, and finally, we, we just pick some combination that works best in terms of cross-validation accuracy. A much more efficient uh, variant will be to do randomized search. Uh, randomized. So again, it's a, a research uh, field, how to find these parameters, uh, how to find algorithm with, with, that is going to, be this op uh, to do this optimization. The intuition is that we can have some regions of uh, good cross-validation quality and maybe some regions of uh, bad configurations. Uh, actually, we can optimize with that, and there are very, some of the very smart Bayesian algorithms for, for that. But random search is a very, very strong baseline. So uh, many jokes about that. So Bayesian, uh, all this math and all these applications of Bayesian theory to machine learning is such a complicated thing, a very, very advanced math. But for hyperparameter tuning, just randomized search can be a very, very strong baseline. Uh, randomized search is just checking random configurations of your hyperparameters and then again uh, picking the best. But with decision trees, we can allow ourselves to do this exhaustive search with grid search CV, and that's what we'll do here. Okay, grid search CV, it, this is an object, it will take some arg arguments. Um. Okay, so it actually takes a model. It's in SQL learning, it's called estimator. Then it, it will take this param uh, grid, so uh, hyperparameter names, or in SQL learning, it's actually arguments of uh, this class, decision tree classifier, and their values. We'll do it right now, it's just a dictionary. And then you've got scoring, so by default it's accuracy, but you can pass any other scoring here. You can parallelize it. Uh, and jobs uh, setting to uh, maybe infinite, so it will use the maximal uh, number of CPUs you've got. Uh, okay, some other parameters, and CV will stand for cross validation. Okay, so we'll pass here a, a tree, so we already have one. Uh, it will check different arguments, uh, different configurations of hyperparameters, and we need to define this uh, param grid. We can just call it uh, params. It's going to be a dictionary. We need to specify what, which hyperparameters we're tuning. Let's take max depth. Okay, uh, good regions, good good uh, red ranges for these hyperparameters. Uh, it's about some practical experience. Just uh, train several models, and you'll you'll see that for decision trees, you can start with maybe max depth two, maybe up to twenty, but certainly not a uh, hundred. So, of course, the deeper the tree, the more time it takes to train. For now, let's just uh, uh, search from, uh, from 2 to, to 10. And AP, a range, uh, do I need to specify 11 here or 10? Don't remember. OK, let's check. I want to check all values from, 10 to, from 2 to 10. OK, so it will look like that. OK, at the same time, I can uh, tune another hyperparameter, uh, min sample sleeve. 
The idea is almost the same as with max depth, only that low values of mean sample leaf will correspond to deep trees. So if you if you specify only two, you'll build your tree until there are two samples in each of your leaf. If you spe specify a high value, then on the contrary, a tree will be shallow, not very deep. OK, for now, let's just use the very same range for these values. And we pass this guy. Uh, to grid search CV. I will use uh, named arguments so that it's much more clear. So we pass it here as a param grid. And then we need to specify scoring. So by default, it's accuracy and, uh, <coughs> and data. So, uh, so data will come with, uh, again, with a fit method. Sorry, so no data here. But uh, the remaining one is uh, cross validation. We can specify just uh, a number, like five, for, for five uh, fault cross-validation. But uh, you've got separate uh, SQL learn objects to do actually cross-validation, depend depending on uh, what you'd like to choose. This is a preferred way, so I'll also show it to you. So a stratified k fault will be a separate SQL learn object, and we'll pass it here. So stratified k fault, sorry. It's just a way of uh, describing your cross-validation. You see the number of splits, so it's actually the number of faults, whether to shuffle or not, uh, your data, and again, a random state. OK, let's do five-fold stratified shuffled cross-validation. So it's maybe a preferred variant. We'll create an, an object like that, and we'll pass here n splits equal to five. Then we'll shuffle our data each time. And uh, again, for reproducibility, random state, some number. And we'll pass it here as an object. This is a special object for uh, cross-validation. And we'll pass it here to our grid search argument. OK, this is going to return something, a grid search object. I will, I will call it uh, the best tree. So because in the end, it will contain maybe some best setting for our tree. OK, I'm Initializing it, nothing happens because we need to feed data to it. So now I call feed and, and pass here x train and y train. Now it will take some time. Again, with uh, decision trees, it will be really quick. You see what, it, what it's going to, to do here? It will check uh, 10 values of max depth, 10 values of mean sample sleeve, Cartesian product, so overall 100 variants. And it, it will do cross-validation, five-fold cross-validation for each setting. So you'll see it will train a decision tree 500 times. Not really efficient if you've got a large data set or a more uh, demanding model. But now it will do it pretty quickly. OK, maybe some more settings, essential settings that I use. Uh, OK, and jobs will parallelize it. Uh, minus one, one will tell you just use all available cores, uh, maybe 16 in my case, maybe 32. Uh, and you've got verbose, it's just printing intermediate information. Uh, okay, if we specify verbose equals one, it will just print something. Okay, now it says that it's fitting five faults for each of uh, 81 candidates. Uh, okay, why 81? Nine. Ah, sorry, it turns out there are nine settings here. We have from 2 to 10, sorry. Nine settings here, nine here, so 81 variant overall. So 405 uh, decision tree trainings here. But you see, it's really very fast. And now maybe we've got something, why, that's why I called it best. So because we, we've got best per, per params, params. Uh, these are our hyperparams. So mean sample sleeve is 2, max depth is 6. And uh, we've got the best trained tree. Best estimator is going to be this decision tree classifier object already trained and already with these settings. OK, what ranges of hyperparameters to tune? Uh, by the way, a very nice example here. Uh, if we've got an optimal value somewhere in the middle of your range, like with max depth 6, so it's somewhere in the middle between 2 and 10. It's a good sign. So your optimal value is somewhere in between. So it's your origin is nice. But if you have something like that, that means sample sleeve is equal to 2. Well, you see, I started searching from 2 to 10. I, I skipped 1. Maybe it wasn't a good idea. I'll change here to 1. OK, 
uh, with decision trees I can rerun it very quickly. Has anything changed? Actually not. But we, uh, if we find an optimal value on the, on the border of the range that we checked, it's definitely a sign that maybe you'd better check something else. It's like, I really uh, like this statement. Um, the highest uh, place in the Netherlands is just a part of the mountain with a peak in Belgium. The same here, you see? Okay, and we, we've got a best estimator here, best params. And uh, okay, and what's more, most important, what, what else best we, we've got here, best score. So this is going to be the best score via cross-validation. So we did cross-validation uh, 405 times, and the best average cross-validation accuracy here was 94 dot something, uh, a bit better than 92. Okay, now we've got, so this is actually our CV, uh, cross-validation assessment. So it's the best uh, average accuracy uh, in our cross-validation procedure. Mm. Okay, I'll write that it's cross-validation uh, <coughs> assessment of model quality. And we also have uh, holdout. So maybe now is the second time to take a look at uh, this holdout assessment. Uh, so we'll, again, we'll take the best fitted tree. So we don't need to refit it with these uh, hyperparams again. So it, it's contained here wi within best estimator. And we can just call best tree predict. I'll call this uh, a better prediction. So again, prediction hold out. Maybe now it's better, but let's check. Uh, so we'll, we'll take our best tree, this tun tuned one, and call predict again with x hold out. And now again, accuracy score between the same answers, y hold out, and now our new prediction. Okay, it's, it's indeed better. So if we see an increase uh, on our hold out uh, uh, accuracy uh, in our hold out assessment, both in hold out and cross validation, it's a good sign. Uh, so it was the first one was cross validation assessment, now it's a hold out assessment. Okay, I'll return to this one, uh, to our initial tree where we didn't uh, actually tune it, just to show you how you perform cross-validation. Uh, if, if you don't need to do grid search, it's, it might be really computationally heavy. What if I just uh, stick to some model, uh, maybe here initial one, and I just want to do cross-validation only? Let's do it first by hand, just to understand uh, how it works. Uh, so. Actually, to tune max depth, we're going to do cross-validation for some values of max depth. Let's do it by hand, and then I'll show how it's done in SQLR. It's, it will be really quick. Uh, okay, so it was here, the first one, the first tree. Let's do cross-validation here as well. I'll start with simple Python loop. Uh, so I would like to iterate with... Uh, I'd like to change my uh, accuracy, oh, sorry, to change my max depth from 2 to 10. Okay, so I'll have something like max depth uh, range. Actually, I will iterate for max depth in this range. And uh, again, I'll stick to uh, a range from 2 to 10. I'm going to fit the, the, the tree of this max depth and uh, check cross validation accuracy. Okay, so I'll re reinitialize my tree as being a decision tree classifier with the, the very same random state, but now its max depth will be this current max depth value. Okay, so now. Sorry, my recording is sometimes not ideal. I need to put it higher. Okay. This is a local variable. I can uh, put a, any name here. Uh, actually, Python beginners struggle with these expressions like max depth ex equals max depth. Uh, so I will rename it here. It will be current max depth. So I'm iterating. That's why it's current on current iteration. And it only says that I'm setting max depth argument of the decision tree classifier 
uh, class to be equal to this current value. OK, now I'll perform cross-validation. And uh, again, here in uh, sklearn uh, model selection, we've got a special function just for cross-validation. So from sklearn model selection, we import cross-val score. That's what we're interested in. Cross-file score will do the same, but only without uh, parameter tuning. So if we know the model, we'll, we'll take cross-file score, we'll pass a tree here, then data, then again scoring and uh, CV scheme, and that's it. And we'll get some, uh, some score. Okay, I'm a bit mixing the order of execution here. So I'll put our uh, cross-validation scheme here. So stratified k fault is here. Uh, otherwise, it's just it's going to be an, one more ugly notebook. <laughs> OK, so uh, I know my cross-validation scheme. And I, here, I just call cross fault score. Let's do it once for the whole data set. So I've got three. And I specify, let's put named arguments here again. Our estimator is uh, our tree object. Uh, our x is going to be initial x. Uh, now let's take x train. Y will be y train, and we'll get some figure. Oh, some sorry, some number right now. Uh, y train. Now cross validation scheme. We pass cv equals this S skf uh, cross validation object. Okay, and scoring is by default accuracy. If you uh, executed, you see five actually numbers. These are five values of uh, cross validation accuracy. So actually, the tree was fi uh, fitted here five times. We, we covered this scheme, how it's done, and that's why we, we see five values of accuracy. And to get just, just one, uh, typically we save these results as our cross valves, cores, and then. Uh, just take the mean, cross valve score mean, and this is our average cross validation accuracy. Uh, sorry, cross valve. I wanted to say validation, validation scores. So we, we save it into a special uh, variable and just take a mean of these valve scores. Okay. 19, 90.7 or 8. OK, let's do it uh, in a loop for different values of uh, max depth. So we'll do just the same, and we'll be the, build a plot. So we calculate validation scores. We've got this tree. We pass data here. Uh, and we'll have a list of accuracies. Let's call it uh, accuracies uh, by depth. Just a list. And so we need to append to this list uh, Average cross validation accuracy, just append uh, this well scores mean. A very nice thing to use uh, in pure Python is TQDM. It just uh, shows you some widgets uh, how your uh, iterations in a loop are executed. OK, I'll just show you. It counts your number of executions uh, from TQDM import. TQDM, and you pass it here to actually an, any collection or even a generator. So just a wrapper around a collection. And now you've got a, a widget. Actually, for notebooks, it's uh, a bit more tuned, TQ, TQDM notebook. But in pure Python, it's only TQDM. TQDM notebook, and now it prints this, uh, actually visualizes this nice widget. But still, for a decision tree, is uh, very quick, so we actually don't need it. But if it re cross validation requires more time, then it will be nicely visualized. Okay, now we've got accuracies by uh, by depth. It's a Python list. Okay, it's it's all clear that we'll, we'll have some optimal values here. Uh, let's do it a bit more uh, involved. Uh, let's calculate at the same time uh, holdout accuracy. And, and we'll build, build two plots how our cross validation accuracy and holdout accuracy depend on max depth. Uh, so I'll call it CV accuracies and then uh, holdout accuracies. Mm, 
just ho for holdout. This will be two Python lists. Uh, okay, so actually a typical ugly data science notebook uh, messing things up. But yeah, if you follow the lecture, it will be really, really nice. And I sh share the source only as is, uh, no modifications so that you can keep track during the lecture. Okay, so this will be added up. Cross validation score will be added here to a special list, and then we'll uh, retrain our model. Yep, we did cross validation uh, for our part of our training set. But this is a simple function, it doesn't re retrain it on the whole uh, available set. So we'll call uh, fit with all our available train part, and then we'll make a prediction for a holdout set. So then here, tree predict uh, for x holdout. And then we append accuracy to another list. So this uh, here will go accuracy score uh, between y holdout and this prediction. OK, let's call it current holdout prediction. And definitely for your own code, you, you'd better write commands. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be really messy. So here I, for each, I would say, for each value of max depth, Actually, it's obvious from the code that's from 2 to 10. Uh, not obvious, now it's to 10. Uh, okay, so I perform cross validation. And then I calculate accuracy on the holdout set. Uh, assess the model with the holdout set. OK, took a bit more time. Now I've got two, uh, <coughs> two lists of my average cross validation accuracies and holdout accuracies. OK, now let's, let's just struggle a bit and plot it. OK, so PLT plot, I'll take the values of my, uh, actually, the range of my max depth. It will be an x axis. And actually, it's better to just a bit to refactor it. So that will be obvious that we are iterating th through max depth. So it will be something like all not uh, max depth values. It will be this range. I pass it here. It's not really nice to to write again np a range two ten. So it's much simpler like that. I've got a special variable for that. Now it's clear that it's going to be an x axis. And here I pass my CV accuracies, and then uh, the same for holdout. PLT plot, holdout accuracies, and then, no, sorry, first max depth values, and then holdout accuracies. <coughs> max depth of, okay, with decision trees, I can run it again. Uh, really very quick to, to build. And now I've got some plots. Cool. Just a bit of movements to do it a bit nicer. Uh, so this one is going to be uh, labeled as uh, CV, cross-validation. This one is going to be labeled as holdout. We can color it. Let's say here color will be blue and here orange. And then I put a legend. Finally, PLT legend. And my plot is nicer. OK, it will be even nicer if I do x label, put max depth here, uh, max depth. Y label is actually accuracy. Y, uh, sorry, y axis. So a label will be accuracy here. And that will do. Actually, what I built here, it's called uh, validation curves. So I uh, just visualize the process of validation. It's not necessary, but uh, delivers some intuition. So I'll put a title, uh, decision tree, uh, validation 
curves for uh, max depth. OK, that's it. Yo! OK, what it tells us. So some values of max depth are better than others, obviously. We can keep track of cross-validation accuracy and holdout accuracy. I would say it's just for visualization. As I mentioned, it's not very nice to reuse holdout uh, so many times. So if you check loads and loads of configurations uh, of uh, max depth and check always with holdout accuracy, uh, then you are going to overfit for holdout, just for visualization purposes. Only to illustrate that uh, indeed some values uh, of max depth are better than others. So actually via cross-validation and uh, in this process of uh, grid search, we'll uh, keep the value of 6. Actually for decision trees, it's very often it's a nice value, only that with uh, Gradient boosting will, beat, uh, will build uh, trees of typically of depth from 3 to 6, so really shallow trees. Uh, okay, with random forest we'll cover it, we'll use much uh, deeper trees. So actually these uh, curves show us that we can just keep some values of hyperparameters that work nice in our task. Just a visualization for that. Again, our brain works uh, better if we visualize something. OK, now let's visualize the tree itself. It's also going to be exciting. So what actually, how actually it works, what insights it, it's going to provide. Here I would say that sklearn doesn't have a perfect visualization for, for trees. Actually, it, uh, sklearn uh, exports trees into a dot format, and you'll need graphviz for that. OK, so the first one part will be uh, to install GraphViz, it totally depends on your operation system, how you do it, GraphViz. So it's actually a program for visualizing graphs, obviously. Uh, then you, you'll need a Python package for that. PyDot will work with a dot format, so a tree will be exported into a dot format. Okay, it's all done already in a Docker image, so you, if you are here in the repository, you can go to Docker files. It's all installed here in, the, in this Docker file. There is a special notebook, check Docker, that can show it for you. So how you can actually check your setting. setting so we can make sure all the versions of libraries are just the same to reproduce it uh, fully. OK, and here's also a, an example of a visualization. Uh, doesn't render nice on GitHub. What about NB Viewer? Ah, OK, I'll build it. So right now we'll build just the same. OK, I'm not going deep into this process. So it's too technical. Uh, but uh, in a nutshell, we'll uh, export our tree in a dot format, and then we'll visualize. You can do it even online uh, with the online tools. OK, so from the very same sklearn tree mod module, we'll take export graphviz. And we'll, uh, sorry, import, import uh, graph, uh, export graphviz. What it takes, uh, it takes our decision tree. You specify a file where to output it, tree dot, dot, dot. Uh, you can restrict max depth on, only in terms of uh, visualization. You can provide feature names uh, and uh, something else. OK, field, field will color the nodes itself. OK, let's, let's just take a look. Uh, we'll have our best tree. Now it's important to pass best estimator that it's actually a, a tree. Uh, so it's going, let's again use named arguments. It's going to be this decision tree. Then out file uh, will be, <coughs> okay, just tree dot. Yeah, it's actually by default. Well, then we'll, I'll color notes, it's field equals true. And I can only pass feature names and I'll have a nice picture. Uh, so feature names is going to be where do we take feature, feature names from? Uh, from our date frame, yep. When we did uh, this split, OK, we popped state. Uh, OK, I think df drop churn still has our feature, feature names. Uh, we dropped state, and then 18 features are here. Yeah, right. OK, so feature names will be taken from, from our data frame. Uh, this one. Only that we, we take columns. 
OK, something happened. So we can see it here, ls uh, everything dot dot. And we'll see here's our tree dot. You can go online for something like, uh, uh, let me remember, something like uh, visualize uh, dot online. OK, it's called web graphviz. Maybe we see it. Yeah, webgraphviz.com. So actually, dot format something like that. You can uh, generate a graph for that. Uh, so here it is. And we just pass here our uh, our dot file. Yeah. So if we open it in our favorite editor or just do cat, uh, cat tree dot, here is how it looks like. Just some, OK, mar maybe similar to markup language, just, just to describe our graph. You then don't need to go into details, just copy paste it here in web graphics, and you'll you'll have your tree. Woohoo! Okay, so here's the tree. Okay, for us, for us, a tree of uh, maximal depth six works the best. Uh, only for visualization purposes, let's just refit it very quickly again with max depth of three, just to have a nicer picture. Okay, very quickly, just tree equals decision tree classifier with the very same random state and uh, max depth of uh, three. I could have restricted it in visualization, but I would like to show you the leaves itself. Now they're on the depth of six, not very convenient. Uh, three, max depth of three. OK, I can fit it right in the very same cell. Just fit it here and uh, labels, of course. And I ju just do the same, export it into another dot object. Let's call it uh, tree depth three. And it's, now it's actually this <coughs> tree, tree object. Again, very messy, but OK. I've exported it. Let's do cat again. Uh, cat this uh, tree depth three dot. Yeah. Again, copy pasting it. So uh, I'm doing it uh, online because it's really convenient. You use uh, graphviz and pydot actually to, to do it locally. OK. So here's the tree. Now it's getting interesting. Um, can we download it from here? Uh, I think no, HTML. Uh, then I'll, just once, I'll show you how to do it locally, just to have a nice picture here in the very same notebook. Uh, it's not nice. Uh, okay, I can, I remember how to do it with dot. For now, I'll just copy paste this piece to visualize it in the notebook itself. Okay, so the very same can be done. Reading data to a string I/O object, no details here, but just exporting graphviz, uh, not to a file, but to uh, this special object. OK, and it will depict the tree right here. OK, uh, decision tree. Out file is going to be not a file, but this object dot data. Uh, otherwise, the same. OK, sure, I need to import it. Import string. Uh, Nothing good with copy pasting, yep. So I need to actually remember what. Okay, it's from IO. Uh, from IO, I'm importing this. Okay, I think I just need to shut up and show you the decision tree. <laughs> okay, uh, string IO uh, from IO and pi.plus. Ah, and the image as well. If you co copy paste, do it until the way, until the end with imports as well. Okay. Yeah. Now we've got a picture. We can actually save it to a file. Uh, okay. So can we see it clearly? Maybe. Okay. So actually, the first feature to to test is total day minutes. So how much clients actually use uh, phone? We compare it to some threshold, so not really much insight from this the the very so from this exact threshold. 
So by default, a tree uses a Gini criterion. Just by the same token, uh, zero values are perfect. Uh, something close to one is, uh, is worse. Also, another criterion for, for chaos metric, like entropy. Initially, we had 2,333 samples. The distribution was uh, 350 uh, churned, and others were loyal customers. And the more good clients you've got, the brighter is going to be the cell. So this orange one will stand for good clients, and these uh, blue ones are going to be uh, to show cells where you, you have more uh, bad clients. OK, so we can keep track. Uh, at this point, it, it picked up voicemail plan. OK, not perfect depiction. Actually, it checks whether it's less or equal to 05, but it's actually a binary attribute. Uh, OK, strange that it picked up this one. Uh, but it also picks up international plan. We, we've seen that it's a really very Im important feature. Customer service calls. We've seen a nice insight that it's also a predictive feature. International plan, again, total day charge. Uh, total if charge, but these are actually, actually proportional to minutes. So we use day minutes and uh, evening, evening minutes. Okay, and finally we've got leaves, and here in every leaf you've got target distribution. So we we restricting the depth, so our leaves are not going to be ideal. So again, some uh, mixture of good and bad clients in in every leaf. But you see, some leaves are predominantly with uh, good clients. Some are predominantly with bad clients. Like, like this one, 71 bad client and only two good. OK, so if you, so for prediction, uh, it's going to work like this. We, we've got a new client with new features, and we follow the decision tree. And if we end up with this leaf, you see, it's pretty obvious that it's going, we are going to predict that the, like, the client is going to be bad. OK, let's uh, gain some intuition from, from here. So if this client uh, doesn't, Talk too much on, no, on the contrary, yeah. If if, if the client uses uh, total uh, uses the phone too much, so greater than this threshold. If the client has a voice, uh, so doesn't have voicemail uh, service, and if uh, his charges are pretty high, then we're going to predict that this guy is going to churn. And we already s have seen this intuition that if they use. Uh, their phone too much, they tend to churn, maybe because they're... On okay, we, we can only speculate of why it's going, of why it takes place, but we see confirmation here. Well, actually for this task, if we apply something more complicated, we'll don't have, we won't have a really ni nice increase in uh, accuracy. So for this task, a decision tree is actually doing a very nice job, uh, around 94% accuracy. And we can have this picture. We can gain some intuition how it works. If we switch to random forest, actually in these tasks, uh, the increase is not going to be really high. Maybe up to 96%. And uh, it's a matter of actually, uh, it's about actually the business ta task, the business side. Is it worth it? 2% increase. In some tasks, it, it definitely it's every percent is very, very important. But here, maybe not. OK, so a decision tree is actually doing a nice job here. Uh, so next time, we'll, we'll cover linear models that are preferable in, uh, in the case where you've got really lots and lots of features. Uh, what else I wanted to show? Uh, OK, actually, I wanted to run random forest here, uh, just without deep understanding what, what, what is it. Uh, okay, we'll do so uh, in, in two weeks when we actually discuss uh, random forest. Okay, if we try to, to apply uh, decision trees for, let's say, the, this Alice competition, when, where we with, will have lots and lots of features, uh, you can try, you'll see it doesn't work really well. Uh, just again, because with uh, very high dimensions, it doesn't work very, actually very well. OK, when we go to linear models, we'll discuss it, why actually it, it's the place. OK, that's it. So, so see you next time. <laughs>